All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexia Kelly. I'm the Senior Director of Research at the UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health, and I'm here with Dr. Penny Gordon Larson, who's a professor of nutrition and the Gillings Associate Dean for Research. And we'd like to welcome you to our next Building COVID Research Collaborations webinar. Uh, we have another one of these scheduled in the coming weeks, including Barb Turpin and Joe Brown, who will be presenting an overview on current research on environmental transmission and surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 on August 11th, so please stay tuned. For a little logistics about today's webinar, I'll be introducing our speakers and then they will speak in turn, and then when we will follow the presentations with a Q&A session um, with questions from the viewers. We ask that you type any questions you have for the presenters in the Q&A box. Um, you can do this throughout the presentation. And then following the presentations, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Gordon Larson, who will moderate the Q&A session and will read the questions aloud to our presenters. The title of today's talk is Statistical Considerations in the Design and Analysis of SARS-CoV-2 Prevalence Studies. Uh, I will now introduce our speakers. Um, this has been a challenging time for all of us, so we've asked them how they are coping. Uh, Dr. Bani Shuksa is the postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Biostatistics, and she has been coping with COVID by taking up biking during the pandemic to escape her email inbox. Uh, when Dr. Shuksa is finished with her presentation, she will turn the floor over to our second speaker. Dr. Michael Hudgens is a professor in the Department of Biostatistics and the director of the Biostatistics Corps of the Center for AIDS Research. His COVID coping mechanism is to use a random number generator to decide which emails to respond to. So with that, I would like to turn the webin over, webinar over to Dr. Shuksa. Thank you so much yeah. and thank you all for joining today. Um, so um, we'll be talking about some statistical considerations in the design and analysis of SARS-CoV-2 prevalence studies. Um, I'll start out today by talking about the different types of prevalence studies currently being conducted and then discuss the generalizability of results from these studies. I'll focus a little bit on the different types of sampling methods that can be used in a prevalence study, and I'll finish up by talking about a couple of different case studies, the Chatham County COVID-19 cohort, or the C4 study, and the RECAP UNC effort. So one type of study that's being implemented broadly is a study of point prevalence. With a point prevalence study, the goal is to estimate the proportion of the population with an active COVID-19 infection. These studies are really important for modeling transmission dynamics and evaluating risk factors for infection. Um, active infections are detected using PCR testing, which are typically based on nasal or throat swabs, and a positive PCR test indicates an active infection. There are some issues surrounding the sensitivity and specificity of PCR tests, particularly in regards to, to the timing of these tests and how that relates to symptom onset and disease severity. I won't get into that too much today, but these are important issues that need to be considered when designing a prevalence study. The other broad class of prevalence studies being conducted are studies of seroprevalence. With seroprevalence studies, the goal is to estimate the proportion of the population with detectable SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. These are detected using a serology or antibody test that detects the presence of antibodies in the blood. And this provides evidence of a prior infection. People with COVID-19 typically develop antibodies one to three weeks following infection. Although for some individuals, this takes longer. Um, it's being found that for some individuals don't develop antibodies at all. And it's unknown how long antibodies will remain detectable in the blood following infection. Um, despite these limitations, um, seroprevalence studies are important because there's a non-negligible proportion of the population who are infected with COVID-19, but did either did not experience symptoms, didn't seek care, or simply weren't tested for COVID-19. So this becomes important when we estimate things like the infection fatality ratio, which is the ratio of COVID-19 deaths to infections. If we simply rely on the number of clinical PCR positives in estimating the denominator, that can be a significant underestimate. So serology testing allow, gives us a more complete picture of COVID-19 infections. Individuals infected with SARS-CoV-2 experience a range of symptoms following infection. The period between infection and symptom onset is known as the pre-symptomatic phase. The period when symptoms are present is known as the symptomatic, symptomatic phase. 
this is the time in which individuals would be most likely to seek out a clinical PCR test because they have symptoms present. One to three weeks following infection, antibodies developed for some individuals. Um, these could be detected using a serology or antibody test. Other individuals never experience symptoms. These individuals are asymptomatic. They would be less likely to seek out a clinical PCR test during infection, but had they been sampled for, say, a point prevalence study and receive a PCR test, they would test positive. Some of these individuals would go on to develop antibodies that could be detected using serology or antibody testing. In a prevalence study, the target population is the population to which we want to make inference. In the population, in the target population, some individuals are infected and others are not. Um, so here we'll assume that we're doing a point prevalence study and the red individuals here have an active infection, the gray individuals do not. Um, it would be in most cases too time, cost, and resource intensive to test everyone in the population. So our goal in a prevalence study then is to select a sample from that population, estimate prevalence within the sample, and then generalize those results back to the target population. Um, there are a number of target populations that could be of interest to researchers um, it, to conduct a prevalence study. Um, patient populations could be individuals who are receiving healthcare services um, versus a more general population could be all residents within a state, county, or municipality. Um, the important thing is that the, the sample should be drawn from the target population and be representative of the target population. So the generalizability of the results um, from a prevalence study back to the target population um, depend on a few different factors. So what type of sampling method was used? Um, studies have been and will continue to be conducted using both random and non-random sampling methods and also the analytic approaches, which vary depending on the type of sampling that was conducted. When sample design is either ignored or the analytic methods are inappropriate, extrapolating from the sample to the target population can lead to biased estimation, which can result in misleading estimates of population preva prevalence and mortality rates. So one type of sampling that's commonly um, done in prevalence studies is convenience sampling. With convenience sampling, researchers recruit participants from populations that are convenient to them. Um, so examples of this could mean recruiting from social media platforms, shopping centers, or patient directories. With convenience sampling, because the sampling process is not random, the characteristics of the sample are likely to differ from the characteristics of the target population. Um, the concern would be that there are these individual factors that drive both participation in the study and also risk for COVID-19. Um, so some examples of what these characteristics, individual characteristics might be. Um, an individual with a prior COVID-19 infection might be more likely to volunteer for a seroprevalence study because they had recent symptoms compared to someone without an infection who has been asymptomatic. Um, persons in shopping centers and other public areas where recruitment occur might be at a higher risk for COVID-19 than persons who say are avoiding crowded shopping areas, perhaps due to the presence of high-risk individuals in their households. Um, on the other hand, studies based on social media recruitment have reported underrepresentation of older persons and overrepresentation of non-Hispanic whites. Yet we know that African Americans and Hispanic populations have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So there are analytic methods that can be used to try to remove some of these selection biases that can occur. Um, these typically rely on weighting approaches or model-based approaches. Um, the underlying assumption that's made is that the convenience sample is like a simple random sample from the population, but stratified by the different individual characteristics that are measured in the study. When this assumption holds, um, then the estimators from the convenience sample are unbiased. When it does not hold, then the estimators are biased. So this um, gives us one example of how a convenience sample could steer us wrong if we don't analyze it appropriately. So we have a target population of 100,000 persons here, of which we're going to select 1,000 for our seroprevalence study. Um, you'll see that there's this factor A that's highly associated both with infection of COVID-19 and also with participation in our convenience sample. So individuals with factor A are four times more likely 
to have a prior infection of COVID-19. And they're also highly overrepresented in our sample. They account for only 15% of the population, but they account for 85% of our convenience sample. So if we either don't know about factor A or we fail to account for it in our analysis, then we can end up with a sample estimate that's much larger than the true population value for seroprevalence, which in turn results in a significant underreporting of the infection fatality ratio. So the key when using a convenience sample is to be able to identify the factors that are associated both with participation in the study and risk for COVID-19 and control for those appropriately in the analysis. The alternative to convenience sampling is probability-based sampling. With a probability-based sample, we have lists of members of our target population known as a sampling frame, and we randomly select our sample from that list. So because our, the sampling process is taken out of the hands of the individuals and the, um, the researchers, selection bias due to the sampling method is eliminated and our sample is representative of the sampled population in expectation. We can use tools like stratification and clustering to facilitate some of our goals. So stratification can be used to improve the efficiency of our estimators. It can also be used to oversample certain subpopulations that might, we might be interested in. For example, populations that are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. Cluster sampling can be used for logistic feasibility. So if we don't have a sampling frame available for our target population, we could, for example, sample uh, geographic areas and implement a cluster design. Um, one hallmark of survey sampling is that we use sampling weights in our analysis. The sampling weights are the reciprocals of the probability of selection for each individual. Um, these can be thought of as representing the number of individuals in the target population that each individual member of the sample represents. So there are a number of sampling frames that can be considered for if you're going to use a probability-based design. So if you're interested in making estimates for the general population, I've listed here three possible sampling frames. So address-based sampling frames are based on commercially available versions of the Postal Service's mailing address file. Um, these lists are readily available, fairly inexpensive. So you can select a sample um, pretty quickly. They've also been validated to have very high coverage of, of the general population. Um, enumerated lists are essentially build your own sampling frames. So you might select a geographic area and then send, in, send individuals out into the field to enumerate households in that area. Um, this tends to be more time and cost intensive than address-based sampling. Random digit dialing studies, um, we recruit participants by telephone. Um, these um, can be a useful method for recruitment um, but it can be difficult to target geographic areas using random digit dialing. Um, for other populations, sampling frames are a little more custom. So for example, if you wanted to um, conduct a seroprevalence study at a university, then you might obtain a list of all members um, of the faculty, staff, and students affiliated with that university. Um, census data can be very useful when designing a probability-based study. It can be appended onto the sampling frame and that can facilitate targeted sampling towards certain demographic groups. But probability-based designs are not without their own challenges. Um, while selection into the sample from the sampling frame is a random process. So we expect our sample to look like our sampling frame in expectation. But if we have poor correspondence between our sampling frame and our target population, then that can lead to what's known as coverage error. Um, with coverage error, um, you might see, for example, um, you want to estimate seroprevalence among persons 65 and older, but you don't include nursing homes or assisted living facilities on your sampling frame. So that, then you could end up with a misleading estimate of seroprevalence, and that would be an example of coverage error. Um, even with a perfect sampling frame that corresponds with the target population, you can still incur some bias with a probability-based design. So once you select your sample, not all individuals will be willing to participate in your prevalence study. Some will end up responding and participating, others will refuse. And if this response status is correlated with factors that affect COVID-19 risk, then you could end up with non-response bias. Um, so 
um, it's important when using a probability-based design to carefully select a sampling frame where coverage of the target population is well understood and also to follow best practices to maximize study participation, like using community engagement efforts, multiple modes of contact, um, the use of incentives and multiple follow-ups. Um, there are analytic methods that have been developed to adjust sampling weights for both non-response and sampling frame under coverage. Um, these methods typically rely on a missing at random assumption. Um, finally, the one drawback to probability-based designs is that they tend to be more costly and take longer to implement than convenience samples. Um, because it takes time to design the study, um, recruit participants rather than relying on willing volunteers. Um, and we do have a need for more timely estimates of seroprevalence. Um, so one method to reduce costs and obtain estimates more quickly is to recruit participants for the study within an existing representative sample. Um, researchers in Geneva recently published a paper in The Lancet using this approach, and researchers on the C4 study at UNC are using the same approach. Um, so when some of the initial seroprevalence studies came out, um, my colleagues and I saw how um, widely the results were being reported by the media and how they really had the potential to impact policy. Um, and we think that it's critically important to use sound methods to design these and analyze studies of seroprevalence. Um, so along with Ross Boyce and Allison Aiello, um, I recently published a perspectives article in JID where we discuss some of these issues surrounding generalizability of COVID-19 prevalence studies and offer some guidelines for producing more timely estimates of seroprevalence within a probability-based framework. Um, so I'll now talk about a couple of case studies that are being conducted here at UNC. Um, the Chatham County COVID-19 cohort or the C4 study is aiming to estimate monthly incidence and cumulative prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 seroconversion um, within the population in Chatham County, um, and also to look at some risk factors for infection. Um, Chatham County has seen a large number of infections per capita. It's in close proximity to UNC Chapel Hill, and it has an ongoing probability-based study with which we could partner. So this made it a good area um, to focus on with this study. So the C4 study is a prospective longitudinal cohort where participants will complete bi-monthly questionnaires and have monthly clinic visits where there'll be both PCR testing for point prevalence and serology testing for seroprevalence. So there'll be 12 months of follow-up in the study and the C4 study will be overlaid on an existing probability-based survey known as the Chatham County Assessment or the CCA. Um, the CCA is a longitudinal stratified multi-stage cluster sample of households representative of Chatham County. So in the C4 study, we want, to, we want to recruit between 250 and 350 individuals. Um, so among those individuals, our sample will come from two different sources. So individuals from the CCA who are willing to be recontacted for our study will make up a portion of those. Um, in addition, we'll, we're selecting a supplemental sample using address-based sampling um, to arrive at our 250 to 350 participants. Um, because we know how important it is to minimize the potential for non-response bias, we'll be using multiple modes of contact um, to recruit participants. All study materials and questionnaires are going to be available in both English and Spanish. Um, and we're also offering the optional self-collection of nasal and blood samples for individuals who are unable to come to the clinic or feel uncomfortable doing so. The other study that I'll talk about is the RECAP UNC study. Um, in this study, our primary objective is to determine if prevention methods are effective in reducing spread of SARS-CoV-2 on campus and among the research community. Um, so this study is playing a critical ro role in UNC's reopening effort. Um, with this study, we'll be able to track point prevalence over time and see whether or not the trend is going up or heading down. Um, so this study has, is a cohort study that's going to have nested cross-sectional samples of individuals. The target population are individuals at UNC, both employees and students, who are participating in research-based activities and are working on campus. 
The panel will have up to 4,000 participants. Um, and within the panel, we'll be collecting uh, nasal swabs for PCR testing. We'll be doing antibody testing. And we'll also be giving self-administered online questionnaires at baseline and at months one, three, six, nine, and 12. In addition, from the panel, we'll be selecting probability-based samples of size 1,000 on a biweekly basis to do PCR testing and evaluate um, risk factors and exposures for COVID-19. So one key statistical challenge in this study is that we have this asymptomatic population, right? So we're doing PCR testing within an asymptomatic population and we're estimating a very low prevalence outcome. And it's to our advantage, both from a statistical standpoint, but more importantly, from a public health standpoint, to identify cases in the population where they are. So we're planning to use a risk stratification approach where we identify factors using baseline data to divide our panel participants into risk strata. We would then oversample high risk individuals relative to low risk individuals. But there's some uncertainty about which risk factors are gonna be most predictive for infection and how effective this stratification approach is going to be. So we're planning to use adaptive sampling and over time, as we accumulate more data, we're going to refine how these risk strata are formed and the allocation of sample across risk strata. So to conclude my portion of the presentation, um, SARS-CoV-2 prevalence studies play a critical role in guiding our response to the pandemic. There are a number of statistical considerations surrounding the design and analysis of these studies that need to be considered. And we need to carefully consider um, how we design and analyze these studies to ensure the generalizability of our results. So I'll now turn things over to Professor Michael Hudgens. Thanks, Bonnie. <clears throat> that was uh, really great. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up uh, by going over uh, two projects that our group has been involved in. Um, the first one is a, um, a seroprevalence study in uh, asymptomatic population, and then the other is a, uh, a specimen pooling model that we developed uh, for labs that want to scale up uh, COVID-19 testing. So <clears throat> in this first project, our goal is to uh, estimate uh, seroprevalence in an asymptomatic population, uh, and the investigators uh, we were working with had access to uh, a convenient sample of specimens from asymptomatic individuals. So unlike the setting that Bonnie talked about, uh, we did not have um, a, a sampling frame or, or probability-based sample, but rather a, a convenient sample. So in terms of analytical challenges, the first um, is obvious based on all the points Bonnie raised, which is uh, you know, the potential for selection bias that the this convenient sample is possibly a bias sample from the target population. And then um, a second uh, challenge is that um, the um, antibody test uh, that's being used is not necessarily perfect. Uh, so we need to allow for uh, the possibility that the sensitivity and or specificity of the test is less than 100%. So to deal with these two challenges, um, we are using uh, standardization and um, what we're calling the rogan gladen estimator. And so I'll just say a few words about uh, both of these pieces of the approach. So first, um, in terms of the, the estimator uh, to account for um, imperfect sensitivity and specificity, we're using an approach that dates back at least uh, to Rogan and Gladen in this HAE paper in 1978. And the idea is quite simple. So typically, if we wanted to estimate the prevalence um, we would just take the proportion of individuals in our sample that test positive. Uh, say p hat equals x over n, where x would be the number of individuals in your sample that test positive, and n would be your sample size. But the problem with that sort of naive estimator is it doesn't account for the possibility that you have false negatives and, and false positives um, due to imperfect sensitivity and specificity. So uh, if we let uh, pi denote the true prevalence, uh, then the probability an individual test positive, P, uh, will be equal to um, this expression, pi SE plus one minus pi times one minus SP. And basically what this is saying is 
with, with probability pi, a person is, is zero positive, and then you multiply that by SE because they, the, the test is giving you the right answer, or um, they are in fact negative, uh, but you have a false positive result. So <clears throat> when we use the naive estimator above, we're essentially uh, estimating um, this probability that an individual tests positive P and not the true prevalence pi that we're interested in. Uh, but from this expression, you can, you can solve for pi, um, the zero prevalence, in terms of the, um, the probability somebody tests positive and the sensitivity and specificity. And so that's just a simple algebraic exercise. And that gives you an expression here on slide 26. And so the Rogan Gladen estimator just simply entails plugging in um, the estimator for the probability somebody test positive, and then if known, values of sensitivity and specificity. Uh, often we don't know sensitivity and specificity, but we may be able to estimate it if we have external data. In other words, if we have uh, data sets where individuals are known zero positive and known zero negative, then from those data we could estimate the sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and in terms of accounting for potential uh, selection bias from having a convenience sample, uh, we're using um, the uh, age-old epidemiologic method of standardization. Um, and as Bonnie said, the, the general notion here is that if you, you, you may not be willing to assume the zero prevalence in your sample is similar to that in the target population, uh, but we might be willing to assume that conditional on a, the right set of covariates, uh, within strata defined by those covariates, uh, the zero prevalence in our sample is representative of, of what we would see in the target population. Um, so here is uh, kind of a derivation of, of what's going on. So in the first line, just showing you um, that we can write um, the um, zero prevalence in the target population as uh, kind of a weighted uh, sum uh, or weighted average of the zero prevalence within different strata defined by covariates X. And then under this assumption, uh, we can replace the, the conditional probability of being zero positive um, in the target with, with that of our sample. Next slide. So that um, suggests um, the type of estimator shown at the top of slide 28. Um, a few of the analytical um, considerations when doing this, one is whether or not to apply uh, the rogan gladen correction uh, before or after standardization. Now, in some instances, it won't matter. In either case, you'll get the same zero prevalence estimate. Uh, but um, it can be the case that the rogan gladen estimator is negative, uh, in which case uh, one would typically truncate uh, that value at zero. Um, and so whether or not, um, in, in cases where one truncates, whether or not you apply the correction before or after standardization makes a difference. As statisticians, of course, we don't just want to provide investigators with point estimates, but also some measure of uncertainty. Um, and we'd like that measure of uncertainty to account for not just um, the, the fact that we have a convenience sample, but also that we're uh, potentially estimating the sensitivity and specificity. So the approach we're using is to bootstrap, and not bootstrap not only our data, uh, but also the external data sets that were used to estimate sensitivity and specificity. Um, one issue that can come up there is if um, one has uh, an estimate of sensitivity or specificity that is 100%, uh, that is on the boundary of the parameter space, then the bootstrap can fail to uh, acknowledge that uncertainty. Uh, another issue uh, that comes up is if, um, when defining strata based on covariates, one ends up with small or empty cells in the convenience sample, um, how does one deal with that? Um, in getting your overall estimate of the zero prevalence. Um, so as we worked on this project, um, we, uh, this, this paper came out a few weeks ago in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine by our colleagues at the CDC. Um, you may have seen uh, this, I think this paper got picked up in the mainstream press. Um, and if you dig into it and, and read the statistical approach that they're using, it's actually uh, quite similar to the approach that we were using. So we're sort of happy to see that um, we had arrived at a similar approach for this problem. Uh, most of the work on this project has been led by Sam Rosen, um, who's a, a PhD student in our department. We've done empirical work, so that's simulation studies showing that this works well when uh, we know the, the answer because we're doing sims. 
and um, he's continuing with methodological research and different ways that we might improve this approach. So for this, the second um, project I want to talk about is this uh, specimen pooling project uh, that for labs that want to scale up COVID testing. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Dr. Christopher Pilcher and uh, Daniel Westreich. Uh, you all know Daniel from the Department of Epidemiology. Chris Pilcher uh, was here at UNC uh, many moons ago and he's now at UCSF and uh, Chris and Daniel really led this project um, and I, I provided more of a supporting role. Um, so I'm going to describe um, uh, the model that was developed for this paper which was recently uh, published in JID. So <clears throat> by way of background, high throughput molecular testing for uh, SARS-CoV-2 may be enabled by group testing in which uh, pools of specimens are screened. Um, so the idea here is that uh, we test a pool of specimens uh, with a single test or with a single assay. And if uh, that test is negative, uh, then we would declare all of the specimens in the pool as being negative. Uh, and therefore, uh, we would have a, an efficiency gain in the sense that we've used a single test to screen multiple specimens. Um, and of course, on the other hand, if the pool tests positive, uh, then additional testing would be required to identify which individual specimens in the pool uh, are positive. This idea of specimen pooling or group testing has a long history. It dates back at least uh, until the 1940s. Um, Dorfman described a paper in 1943 of using pooling to screen uh, draftees into the military for World War II uh, for syphilis. And it, since that time, it's been utilized in many different settings. Uh, you see group testing and specimen pooling sort of reborn uh, in a variety of, of settings um, where uh, you've got a test or an assay that is either expensive uh, or in short ply, supply, and you want to use it um, as efficiently as, as possible. Um, so um, Dr. Pilcher and other colleagues uh, at UNC uh, involved in HIV research um, were using specimen pooling back in um, 2005 or so. Uh, and this is when um, our group first became involved in um, studying the statistical properties of these different specimen pooling or group testing algorithms. At the time, uh, the state was using uh, specimen pooling of uh, individuals who were HIV antibody negative um, and then uh, using PCR on pooled specimens uh, to find individuals who were acutely infected with HIV. In other words, recently infected, they had virus, but they did not have the antibody yet. Um, next slide, please. So around that time, we started to begin to study these different types of uh, group testing or specimen pooling algorithms, trying to understand the operating characteristics of them. How efficient are they in terms of number of specimens you can process per test? How, how big do you make the pools? Um, lots of questions. What's the sensitivity and specificity of these algorithms and so on. So in this slide, I'm showing you uh, a few diff three different group testing algorithms that we studied in this paper uh, that Daniel led in 2008. On the left is just a very simple two stage uh, specimen pooling algorithm. So you have a master pool, um, maybe, maybe uh, 10 specimens. You test the pool. If it's positive, uh, then you would go back and test all the individual specimens in that pool. Uh, the middle panel is showing a slightly more complicated uh, algorithm with three stages. Uh, so we test a, a master pool, say it has 25 specimens. If it tests positive, then we uh, would test sub pools uh, of size five. And then sub pools that test positive, we would then go and, and test individual specimens within those sub pools. On the right is an even more complicated algorithm. Um, so suppose we have a master pool, say it's of size 100, and you could imagine uh, taking those 100 specimens and laying them on a, a 10 by 10 grid, and then forming uh, row pools and column pools. Uh, then in the second stage, test the row pools and column pools. Um, and then at the third stage, we would test individual specimens uh, that were at the intersection of positive row pools and positive column pools. 
Um, these are just a few examples of the um, different types of algorithms that have been proposed. Um, they can get quite elaborate. Um, and obviously there's, there's some practical issues here about feasibility, which will depend on the particular lab, whether or not pooling is done by hand or if it can be automated by uh, robotics, say. Um, so <clears throat> uh, back to the present, uh, several labs have uh, been publishing uh, results recently indicating um, use of pooling um, in, in settings where um, there are not enough SARS-CoV-2 tests to go around. Um, but really there's no overall guidance on, on the best strategies for um, developing uh, a pooling algorithm. So we developed a model of uh, the efficiency and accuracy of specimen pooling based on um, uh, available data, current data on what we think are the SARS-CoV-2 viral dynamics. Uh, and then based on the model, we um, compared outcomes that might be expected in different testing situations and tried to provide some general guidelines uh, to laboratories that might be thinking of implementing a group testing protocol. Uh, so this shows the results uh, from, from the model. Um, I'm going to start on the right side of this plot. So on the horizontal axis, we have prevalence. On the vertical axis, uh, these are the uh, number of individuals um, that could be screened uh, with 1,000 assays. So if you're doing individual testing, uh, you could screen 1,000 individuals with 1,000 assays. On the other hand, uh, let's say the prevalence is, is 0.001. Uh, if one uses uh, a two-stage uh, testing, so sort of Dorfman type of approach, uh, you would be able to uh, screen about 14,500 individuals with 1,000 assays. Or if you went to a three-stage approach, you would expect to be able to screen approximately 20,000 individuals with only 1,000 assays. So a massive efficiency gain. Uh, as the prevalence increases, you can see that the efficiency of the group testing over individual testing decreases. Uh, but nonetheless, even at higher prevalence settings like 1% or 5%, we still see substantial increases in um, efficiency relative to individual testing. The left side of the plot shows uh, the number of true positives you would detect with, with 1,000 assays. Um, so again, um, indicating the sort of benefit of group testing that because uh, we're able to uh, screen more individuals, uh, naturally we're gonna, we're gonna detect more of the, the cases that are out there. Next slide, please. Um, this plot is just uh, a really uh, another visualization of, of the sort of results we were seeing on the previous slide. Again, prevalence on the x-axis, efficiency on the y-axis, or in other words, results that you would expect per test comparing a variety of two-stage and three-stage algorithms. Uh, the dashed horizontal line at the bottom is showing you individual testing. So basically any of these algorithms uh, will give you a more efficient result than individual testing with the real yield coming as the prevalence decreases. Um, this is a table from the JID paper showing uh, for different prevalences and either a two-stage or a three-stage approach what is the recommended uh, pooling algorithm? So for example, for a two-stage uh, strategy and a uh, one in a thousand prevalence uh, pools, master pools of size 25 are recommended. The time to results column um, gives you an indication of how many rounds of testing one would expect on average. So with individual testing, that's just a single round. Um, and you can see that because uh, we're doing two or three-stage testing, on average, we, um, the time to results will be more than one, but it's not um, substantial. Of course, this will depend on context and how important it is to get results back to individuals quickly. Uh, the next column showing you results obtained per test, uh, again, giving you uh, a sense of the efficiency gain that one can uh, expect using specimen pooling. Uh, there's no free lunch here, though. Uh, the, the downside of, of um, group testing is a reduction in sensitivity. So when we pool specimens, um, we expect there to be a dilution effect and a loss of, of sensitivity. Um, so the, the column um, third from the right is showing you the, the anticipated loss in sensitivity relative to individual testing if you, one uses the 
uh, recommended pooling strategy. And then finally, um, the last two rows of the table or columns of the table are showing you uh, the positive predictive value uh, using the specimen pooling approach versus individual testing. One, in addition to efficiency gain, one of the advantages of pooling is uh, an increase, sometimes substantial, in uh, the positive predictive value. And the intuition here is because you're repeatedly testing somebody, uh, the likelihood of um, a false positive result goes down. Um, so in conclusion for this paper, um, we found that for a fixed number of tests, we estimate that labs using uh, specimen pooling could screen somewhere between two and 20 times as many specimens compared to with individual testing. Uh, this would yield uh, a greater number of true positive infections identified and improve the positive predictive value. Uh, we made a, available a, a free uh, web calculator to the research community, and this hopefully will help uh, inform laboratory decisions about how to set up uh, their pooling algorithms. Uh, Daniel has a, um, a grant from the state to you know, really spruce up this web calculator. This is kind of version 1.0 and we're hoping to improve upon it in the fall. Finally, a few links uh, to some mainstream press that this work has uh, received. Uh, the NPR story and the Time article both feature um, uh, Chris Pilcher, uh, the local TV station, WRAL interviewed Daniel. And then the, the New York Times article at the bottom doesn't, uh, did not interview um, Chris or Daniel, but um, as you sort of would expect with the New York Times, it's really a great article on specimen pooling, um, some really great graphics and, and um, a nice introduction to a broader audience on this topic. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Center for AIDS Research, which has been supporting some of our uh, COVID work uh, while we get up and running in response to this pandemic. Um, and Bonnie's also received uh, support from uh, the state and uh, the office of the vice chancellor. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Michael and Bonnie. That was really um, wonderful. Um, greatly appreciate these fantastic talks. I have a, a question for each of you. I'm going to start with Michael. Um, uh, in terms of the pool testing, is there, you know, it's great with the efficiency, but is, is there any discussion of somehow policies to prioritize the group testing in areas where there's shortages or delays in getting the results back? Because, you know, it, it would slow for any given individual infected person, it's gonna slow down the process for them to know. Uh, yeah, and I don't know the answer. Um, I've been sort of one degree removed from those types of conversations. Um, I think uh, Daniel Westreich and Chris Pilcher have been more on the front lines of actually talking to labs. Um, I know that an early version of this paper was circulated to the White House, um, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, CDC, and so on, really trying mm -hmm. to get the word out. And, um, and I think uh, Dr. Pilcher's on the, um, the, the group testing or specimen pooling task force um, uh, that's underneath uh, Pence and others. Uh, so they, they would be the ones to better answer uh, that sort of question. I don't know, uh, you know, the details of those sorts of policy um, questions. And, and I, just looking at the list of participants, I don't think Daniel's on right now. Okay. Um, so the question for Bonnie, um, and uh, the question is from the audience, and I'm not 100% sure of, of what the person is asking, but I suspect that they're asking to learn a little bit more of the goal of the first study, which I believe is the Chatham Community Study. So um, what the overarching goals of that study are. Yeah, absolutely. So with the Chatham study, um, the goal is to estimate zero conversion over time. So we're going to collect data initially, and then we'll track among individuals um, that zero convert because we'll doing, be doing serology testing periodically and be able to estimate things like risk factors and among individuals who zero converted, start to look at what, um, you know, what risk factors potentially contributed to that or what associations there are. 
Great. So I have a, another question from the audience. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, correcting for the potential of fading of antibodies in seroprevalence studies? Do either of you have any sense for that? That's not an area that I have um, researched much at this point. Yeah, I, I don't have a great answer either. I mean, I do think, um, you know, in the first study I talked about looking at um, seroprevalence in asymptomatic populations, you know, questions come up about things like when you talk about sensitivity and specificity, say, um, that is, um, you know, sensitivity and specificity in what population? Um, so the, if, for, for example, the sensitivity and specificity estimates that we're looking at uh, are based on um, external data sets that have been on, run in the lab and individuals that were uh, known uh, to have um, SARS-CoV-2. And often those were individuals who were symptomatic, maybe even hospitalized. Um, and so you might expect that the, um, the, the antibody test you're using, the sensitivity and specificity of that is going to be different than if you evaluated um, the sensitivity and specificity in a different population, say that included a mixture of asymptomatic and symptomatic folks. So I did just get a comment from a, a participant, Nadia Vilo, um, who says that the UNC project in Nicaragua is putting a grant in to measure uh, the antibody kinetics over time, which would help to answer that question. So stay tuned. Um, I am wondering if we could shift a little bit to one of the things we were talking about right when we started the webinar, when we were getting set up, and that is about, um, you know, the great strength we have here at uh, Gillings for causal inference and how we might use causal inference in um, finessing some of the, the information that's out there on policy changes, um, policy efforts. Yeah, thanks, Penny. I, I think there are a lot of interesting causal questions to ask here. Um, and, you know, as Bonnie and I put this together, it just seemed like that didn't fit with all these other projects that we were working on. Um, but, uh, you know, somebody's been thinking about um, causal inference methods and applications for a long time. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of interesting questions uh, to, to be asked and answered using those types of approaches. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in sort of uh, trying to assess effects of policies. Um, you know, we might wonder like, what, what is the effect of some policy that comes out of Governor Cooper's office? And, you know, these policies are uh, multidimensional. Um, they're varying over time. There's also this feedback loop that depending on, you know, what we see in terms of the epidemic, the policy might be modified. So how do you really assess the impact of that? Um, and if you could get a good handle on these things, then, you know, that could be used to inform policy moving forward. Uh, another interesting aspect is, um, you know, the potential for uh, spillover effects or, or what in causal inference, what we call interference. Um, so you could imagine that the policy uh, that's adopted in neighboring states like Virginia and South Carolina could potentially have an effect on uh, the behavior of folks in, in North Carolina. In fact, there's a paper that just came out in PNAS uh, by uh, Dean Eccles and colleagues at MIT looking at this. And at least according to their model and, and their analysis, uh, they're showing substantial peer effects between states. Um, and um, you know, kind of the upshot of that paper is um, that there's a, it's, it's really the, the, um, the lack of coordination uh, between states in, in their policies is, um, you know, is, is not optimal. And um, really, if states could coordinate, especially with their peer states, uh, we could have a much bigger impact uh, on the epidemic. Yeah, that would be great. Um, uh, a another question from the audience, do any of the uh, prevalence studies explore the role of children? And so I, I know that we have some, um, some work going on uh, through Gillings, but the question is really, how might we evaluate this more? Yeah, I don't know, maybe Bonnie would be better uh, to comment than myself. The, the asymptomatic seroprevalence study I talked about, um, which I, I can't divulge the details of right now because we're, we're trying to get it published, but uh, it's only in adults. Yes, the Chatham County study is among adults as well, but I think it would be interesting to 
um, have some studies where we measure seroprevalence not only among one individual in the household, but everyone in the household, including children, so we can get a sense of, um, you know, and also ask questions about the presence of symptoms to get a sense of, you know, what proportion of children actually have seroconverted and which of the, you know, what proportion of those actually had symptoms at the time. Yeah, and it, it would also be interesting to do more about the transmission across sites from workplace to home to schools, um, which is, you know, uh, I guess a future step for many people. Um, another question is, could Dr. Hudgens comment further on the negative predictive value of, or of the pool testing approaches? And they're mentioning um, the probability that people in the negative screening test really don't have SARS-CoV-2. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, we only focused on PPV. Uh, we did not look at NPV. Um, we have looked at that in previous studies, but um, we did not look at, at this study. And um, I don't, off the top of my head, recall, um, you know, it's been many years since we did the acute HIV modeling, um, what the um, negative predictive values look like for these different algorithms. But it's, it's um, from a statistical standpoint, uh, these things can be worked out very easily. Um, so if that was something that was of interest, certainly something we could add and, and we could add it to the um, to the web calculator we developed that would be oh that would be great uh, quite quite straightforward to do yeah th I think that would be a super addition um, a, 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 just a comment from um, a, an attendee uh, again with the um, project in Nicaragua they are comparing immune response between children and adults so stay tuned for for more there so I think we're, we're heading towards um, the end of the questions. Um, do either of you want to sign off with any last minute thoughts? Um, no, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present and, and thanks for all the attendees and the great questions. Yeah, Super. absolutely. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's really fantastic hearing about the work and it's so great to see, um, you know, especially the work, um, Bonnie, directly with the Chatham and the campus, you know, really making a difference to our community, um, which is really important. And of course, uh, Michael's work is making a difference, not just, you know, in North Carolina, but beyond. But um, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our attendees. All right. Have a great weekend, everyone.